point uh, by reliving one of the greatest uh, stories of redemption in sports history. And uh, this is not a, uh, a horse racing, uh, you know, a horse racing thing where somebody gets DQ'd at the end and causes mass hysteria. But uh, uh, for some of you, you will know this story. It's one that you know and love. Uh, for some of you, this may be the first time uh, you've ever heard it. Uh, but this story goes way back to October of 2003. Uh, I know for some of y'all, that's a long time ago. Some of y'all young people, that's like the olden days. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, but, but anyway, a long time ago. Uh, but it's the ALCS, the American League Championship Series. It's the New York Yankees uh, versus the Boston Red Sox. And here they are. It's game seven. Game seven, Boston's got, you know, the curse of the Bambino all over them. You know, they sold Babe Ruth back to the Yankees, you know, in 1918. Haven't won anything since. The New York Yankees have won, you know, five out of the last ten World Series and been in a couple more. You know, the Yankees are the superpower. The Boston, you know, they're the lovable losers. They're the, you know, the underdogs. They're, you know, not supposed to win. But it's game seven of the 2003 ALCS. They've got a 5-2 lead going into the eighth inning. Everything looks good. Uh, but then uh, Pedro stays in too long. Grady Little leaves him in there in a huge mistake, and they score back-to-back-to-back-to-back to back to back to back doubles. The Yankees tie the game. It goes in the 11th inning. Wayfield's on the mound, and here comes Amber. Go back one. Whoever's doing it, go back one. There we go. Bottom of the 11th, or bottom of the 11th inning, first pitch, Aaron Boone steps up and hits a home run in the upper deck down the left field line to crush Boston's hearts. New York goes to the World Series. Boston, as always, uh, goes home. And it's just, you know, in true Boston Red Sox fashion, uh, that's how it is. They're out there six outs away with a three-run lead. They squander it. And their bitter, bitter rivals go to the World Series, and Boston goes home. So fast forward to the next October, uh, the season of, of 2004. Again, ALCS, same thing. Uh, Red Sox and the Yankees in the ALCS. Trip of the World Series on the line. You know, they hate each other. They've been fighting all year. Uh, you know, there's multiple brawls during the entire series. It's great. But the first three games all go by the way of the Yankees. The first three games all by the way of the Yankees. And game three, the Yankees won 19-8. to So, yeah, I mean, 19-8. to So they get drugged at home in Fenway. The Red Sox get beat by 11 runs, which is astronomical. Uh, so they're down and out. I mean, they're down 0-3. They just got their butts whipped at home. Um, and so they're dead. They're dead in the water. There's no way they're coming back from this. So it's game four in Fenway. Uh, the Red Sox are down 4-3. Here comes Mariano Rivera, the greatest closer in the history of all times. And he walks the first batter. Pitch runner, still second. They get a blue single, and he scores. So then it goes into extra innings, and then into the 12th, it gets on. Manny Ramirez gets on with a single, and David Ortiz takes the next pitch way out in the right field for a walk-off win, and, and Boston wins, and they're still alive. Down 3-1. Now, I still win three more games, uh, so they, they weren't out of the woods yet, but at least they were still uh, alive. Next game, after playing 12 innings, the next day they played 14 innings. And again, David Ortiz hits a single up the middle to win the game, so a walk-off. Uh, so here they are. They got momentum now. They're still down 3-2. They're still down 3-2. They still got to win two more games. And the Yankees hadn't won, hadn't lost four games in a row all year. All year the Yankees had not lost four in a row. Uh, but here come the Red Sox. So then they get to game six. And game six is like one of the most iconic games ever. You know, there's so much happening in this game. It was known as the Bloody Sock game. Uh, Kurt Schilling gets up on the mound. He had just had surgery on his on his right ankle, and it, and throughout the game they kept showing it, and the blood was spreading through his thing. And he pitched, you know, six great innings, uh, and then Bronson Arroyo comes in and and it pitches great, and then that was the game where A Rod knocked the ball out of his hands coming down the line, which was like the craziest thing ever. I think that's the next one, and of course you know A Rod, I hates A Rod, but you know how it goes. But Boston wins that game four to two. So now here they are going into game seven. Tied up, you know, and it's, you know, this is just the craziest thing ever. No team in Major League Baseball history has ever come back from a 3-0 deficit. So here they are, uh, game seven, whoever wins goes to the World Series. Um, and you just knew in the back of your mind that the Yankees were going to do it one more time and just, you know, break the hearts of every Boston Red Sox fan uh, around the world. Uh, but game seven was by far uh, the most boring game, you know, and the least climactic of the, the seven. Uh, Boston jumped all over them, hit a grand slam in the second. They were up six to nothing, and that was it. And they won that game. They won the pennant, uh, and they went on to sweep the St. Louis Cardinals, breaking their 86-year drought and winning the World Series. 
breaking the curse of the Bambino. It was, it's the greatest story of redemption uh, in all of sports. That's the one word to describe the Red Sox in 2004 was redemption. A team that one year ago uh, lost in a walk-off on Game 7 against their bitter rivals. They were down 3-0 in the series, just lost by 11 runs. They stormed all the way back to win the ALCS and to win the World Series. Redemption. So this morning, uh, what we're doing is we're looking uh, at a story of redemption that's in the Bible. And if you read your chapter this week, chapter 9, um, you already know what I'm talking about. This story of redemption uh, is the story of Ruth uh, and found in, in the Bible in the book of Ruth. Uh, but it's not only the story of Ruth, uh, but also the story of Naomi uh, and their entire uh, family. The story of redemption uh, is a huge story in the Bible, but it's a story of being down and out uh, and being in a completely hopeless situation, in a completely lost situation. Uh, so if you got your copy of the story, you can open up to page 121, or you can open up your Bible to Ruth uh, chapter 1, uh, and we'll look at the text. This is what it says, uh, the first two verses. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mahalo and Kilian. They were, they were Ephraithites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and they lived there. So this story of Ruth uh, happens during the time of the judges, which we covered uh, last week. This was the time in, uh, in between taking over the promised land and before the time of the kings. Uh, and the people had received their inheritance from God, and God had broken up the land into the different tribes. Um, so now there's a famine in the land, and this family has to go to Moab for food. Uh, and any guesses as to why uh, there was famine in the land, uh, if you've been paying attention, uh, you would probably know that it's because the people were disobeying God and had turned away from God and, and there was famine in the land. And they were getting those consequences and the curses of their disobedience. So this family, uh, Elimelech and Naomi and their two boys, uh, they leave their land and they go to Moab and search for food and for search of a better life. Now we can learn a, a huge amount just from these two verses. Just from these two verses alone, we can learn so much. First of all, they were from Bethlehem. This is one of the several mentions of Bethlehem in the Old Testament. But we also learned that Elimelech and Naomi were from the tribe of Ephraim. They said they were Ephraimites. Now, this is something that we would normally just blow by and not really even think about. You know, when we read through it, we just read it and not think about it. But it's, it's super important for us to understand. Uh, the town of Bethlehem was dead square right in the tribe of Judah's uh, land. In fact, it says Bethlehem, Judah, kind of like saying Louisville, Kentucky, or Gordon, Indiana. Uh, this, Bethlehem was in Judah. Uh, you know, that's why in the New Testament, uh, the birth narrative of Jesus said that Joseph and Mary are going to the town of David into Bethlehem because they were from the line of Judah. They were, they were from that tribe. But as we read here, Elimelech and Naomi are from the tribe of Ephraim living in the time of Judah. But in the Jewish culture, you couldn't own land in a different tribe's area. You had to stay within your own area. Uh, basically, if you were from the tribe of Dan, you couldn't go over to the tribe of Asher and buy land there or inherit land there. Basically, if you grew up in Indiana, you couldn't move to Kentucky or vice versa. And the reason was this because the land was an inheritance. This was a gift from God to these people, and that's where they stayed. It was what God gave them, uh, and it was the most important and precious thing to them in the whole wide world. It was what defined them as Hebrews and the members of that tribe as everything. But here we see in the book of Ruth um, that Elimelech and Naomi were living in the province of Judah, but were from the tribe of Ephraim. So this requires a, a little bit of study to, to to understand what's going on, and, and the study pays off. You see, the town of Bethlehem is first mentioned in Genesis 48, when Jacob blesses uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. In this, Jacob, um, Jacob has his favorite son, Joseph, and who he thought was dead, but in reality was in Egypt and was the deputy Pharaoh. And then once they're reunited, he decides to bless Joseph, but not just Joseph, but his two sons, and give them a double portion of his inheritance. So he blesses Manasseh and Ephraim. So in this uh, portion in Genesis 48, Jacob talks about how his, 
his favorite wife, Rachel, the love of his life, that when they were traveling to the promised land, that she died in the town of Bethlehem and was buried in the town of Bethlehem. So he blessed these two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, with an inheritance. And a part of that inheritance was the city of Bethlehem. And that town went to Ephraim. So 400 years before the Israelites even crossed the Jordan to go into the promised land, before God even separated this land, the, the city of Bethlehem, the town of Bethlehem was already given to Ephraim. So even though they were in the town of Bethlehem, squarely inside the town of Judah, anyone in the, in the province or in the town of Bethlehem was from the tribe of Ephraim. This is so interesting because all of the significance that the town of Bethlehem has in the story, in the entire story, obviously with Jesus being born there, with that being the city of David and being the city of Jesus. So these are something, you know, some things that we just miss when we just read through it uh, without digging deep. So here we see there's family in the land uh, and Elimelech and Naomi decide to leave and they give up that inheritance. They give up that piece of land that God has given them and they go to Moab in search of a better life. This is huge, too. Uh, giving up and selling off the land that they would have inherited uh, is huge. This is them giving everything away. This is them cashing in all of their chips and leaving and going away. So they leave their land and they go with their two sons to Moab. They get to Moab and the situation that's already bad goes from bad to much worse. This is verses 3 through 5. It says, Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other named Ruth. After they lived there about 10 years, both Malin and Killian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So Naomi's husband and two sons are now dead. She is far away from home. She has given up all of the state and claimed the land that they have. And all that she has left are two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah. And it's Orpah, not Oprah. Uh, even though Oprah Winfrey's name actually comes from this passage, um, the, uh, on her birth certificate it actually says Orpah Winfrey. And just a little piece of trivia for you in case that ever comes up. Anyway, uh, but, but Naomi decides it's time for her to go back home, for her to go back home to Bethlehem. It's time to go home. She's lost everything, and it's time to put her tail between her legs and go back home. So she tells her two uh, daughters-in-law to just to go. Just go back home, um, you know, go back to your family as widows, and you can go. And Orpah goes back, but Ruth says no. Ruth says she's going to stay with Naomi no matter what. She's going to cling to her no matter what. These are her words in, in verses 16 and 17. But Ruth replied to her, don't urge me to leave you. Or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Man, that's a heck of a passage. Eh? That's, that's, that's an impressive thing to say to your mother-in-law. This is a very famous quote between a woman and her mother-in-law. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. This is serious loyalty and devotion from Ruth. This woman, a, 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 a Moabite, a pagan woman, not a Jew. She's not a Jew. She's not a Hebrew. She's not an Israelite. She's not a part of this. But she is loyal to Naomi. And she says she's going with her no matter where she goes. She said she's going to go all in. She'll become an Israelite. And she will even serve the God of the Hebrews. This is dedication and devotion and loyalty. And this shows us uh, who Ruth truly is. This shows us uh, the great character of who this woman is. She's determined, loyal, and devoted. Just the type of person that God is going to use in his story. Even though she's not part of Israel. Even though she is a pagan. Even though she is a foreigner. God is going to use her. So Naomi and Ruth come back to Bethlehem. And, you know, like I said, Naomi's got her tail between her legs. She's coming back and she is hardened against God. She's upset with God. Now, Bethlehem was a super small town. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot going on there. Um, it was a small town when Jesus was born. It was even smaller, you know, thousands of years before that. Um, so, you know, not a huge number of people. So Naomi coming back would have been like the lead story. You know, everyone knew she was coming back. And, you know, the women start talking her up, you know, and, and, and asking her what's going on. And she said that, you know, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara because God has made my life bitter. She's grief-stricken. She's poor. She is homeless. She is landless. 
uh, her life is seemingly over. She has no hope, no hope of ever coming back. And if the story ended right there, it would be a really depressing story. If the story ended right there, it would be just a story of grief and loss and, and tragedy, and it would be terrible. It would be, like, it would be like if the 2004 Red Sox would have lost in Game 4. It would have been a story that we wouldn't even uh, talk about. It would be a sad story. Poor Naomi is at the end of her rope with no hope. Her and Ruth get back, and, and Ruth now has to provide for herself and for her mother-in-law. So she does what, poor, what the poor were forced to do, and they went into the fields and, and picked up the leftovers. The workers would get done with the harvest, and whatever they dropped or whatever they left on, the, uh, on the, the, the piece of produce, they would take that off. They would come and glean the fields. So Ruth is forced to do that, and she goes out into a, a field, and she picks up the grain, and she catches the eye of the owner of the field, uh, a man named Boaz. And immediately he takes a liking to her. You know, it doesn't say whether she's pretty or anything, but you know, he just, you know, almost like he immediately falls in love with her. And he asks his workers who she is, and they explain that she's Ruth, the one who came back from Naomi, with Naomi. Um, and, and he starts taking care of her right then and there. He feeds her dinner and puts her in the best field and takes great care of her. It's a pretty huge deal. So she goes home. Ruth goes home, and this is what she says. To, uh, this is what happens with her and Naomi. They have this discussion. In uh, Ruth 2, 19-20. Her mother-in-law asked her, Where did you glean today and where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I work with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing kindness to the living and to the dead. She added, This man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. So Naomi is thrilled to hear that, that Ruth is working with Boaz and that Boaz has taken a liking to Ruth. And she tells Ruth that, that he's still showing kindness and that he is one of their guardian redeemers. What in the world is a guardian redeemer? That's not something that has, has stuck. We don't talk about that anymore. We don't have guardian redeemer relationships in the 21st century uh, America. But a guardian redeemer was a close, influential relative to whom members of the extended family could turn to for help, usually when the family line or possessions were in danger of being lost. So basically, in a nutshell, the guardian redeemer, uh, who was also called the kinsman redeemer, uh, would be able to help their relatives out uh, if they were in trouble. This, came, this help came in the form of lineage and, and land because that was really the two most important things to them. You know, having a, a lineage, having someone to uh, pass everything on to as an inheritance and having something to pass on. Uh, the guardian redeemer uh, was, was very important. Uh, if, if a man was married and had no children and then he died, uh, his guardian redeemer, his, you know, his brother, his closest male relative would, would, would take on his widow as a wife and have children with that wife to, um, to get the uh, line, the lineage going still. Uh, the son produced would legally be uh, the son of the dead man. Uh, in Genesis 38, there's a story of Tamar and Onan that shows us exactly uh, that going on. Another role of the guardian redeemer is to buy back land, to redeem land that has been lost by someone who's passed away. Um, the kinsman redeemer would be the person who would have first dibs on buying the lost land. So when we see uh, Elimelech and Naomi go to, to Moab to, to get a better life because they couldn't provide for themselves in Bethlehem, they would have had to give it up their land when they left. And the kinsman redeemer, the first kinsman redeemer, would be the first one to be able to buy that land. And that is, that's pretty important. That's pretty important. But, it, but basically what it is, is in the event of a man's death, the kinsman redeemer would take on the life of that man. He would take the wife as his wife. He would take the land as his land. And he would redeem it all. And if we put this into a, a 21st century context, basically if I died, my closest male relative uh, would marry Brooke and, and become uh, who I am. He would be your next preacher. Let's be honest. So hopefully that would be good or bad. I don't know. Um, so that's where they are in Bethlehem with Naomi. This is Boaz guy is the guardian redeemer. He is the man that can redeem their family. Now the Bible doesn't tell us what relationship. Maybe he's a cousin, maybe a brother, maybe a nephew. We don't know. Uh, but he, we do know he was not the closest relative. There was another guy that was closer to Elimelech. Uh, but Boaz goes and meets with the guy and basically tells him that he really wants to be this redeemer. And he gives it over to Boaz. Uh, and Boaz buys the land of Elimelech. And he gets to marry Ruth, a woman that he truly loves. 
And it wasn't long before Ruth uh, was pregnant and giving Naomi a grandson. And the ladies in the town of Bethlehem loved this from Ruth 4. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better than, to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. And Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. So Naomi is redeemed. Her, her hopeless situation, her life that was completely broken and lost, was redeemed. The land stays in the family, and there's even a child who can inherit the land whose name is Obed. And Obed would end up being the grandfather of the great king of Israel, King David. That's a story of redemption right there. That's a story of redemption. Down and out, and God came through. Down and out, no hope whatsoever. At the end, completely in ruin, completely in destruction, yet they never gave up, and God took care of them. It doesn't only end well, it ends the way that it's exactly supposed to end. They got the land that God gave them. It was going to be in their family. All because of a foreign woman who had faith to follow her mother-in-law and to take on their faith and take on their God. What if Ruth, what if Ruth would have been like Orpah and went back home? What if Ruth would have said, no, I'm going back to my own land. Uh, you can go back to Bethlehem by yourself. How would that story have looked if Naomi would have went home by herself? It wouldn't have ended well. It's very doubtful that Boaz would have redeemed the field. He probably wouldn't have wanted to marry Naomi. Maybe his aunt. That would have been weird. But Boaz noticed Ruth, and he loved her. So much so that he was willing to pay for and redeem the land. Such a great, wonderful story of redemption. A great story. But it's not just a great story. It's not just a, a cool little story, a little side story that's just kind of tucked in the Old Testament just for, you know, a good moral story. It has a lasting impact that if you fast forward a thousand years and 200 pages in, the, in your storybook, we can see this. On pages 318 and 319, and in the book of Matthew 1, 1 through 6, it says this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, the mother of Tam whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Abinadad, then the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of King David. In the 28 generations after King David, another boy was born in Bethlehem, and his name was Jesus through Joseph and Mary. So there you look in, in this genealogy of not only King David, but Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see Ruth, this Moabite woman, this, this woman who does not belong there at all because she's a foreigner. She's not a Hebrew. And you can see her, her new mother-in-law, her first mother-in-law was Naomi, but then after marrying Boaz, her new mother-in-law uh, was, was Rahab, who we talked about a couple weeks ago. The prostitute who helped the people in Jericho, who helped the spies in Jericho. All because she had faith in God and she followed her mother-in-law. All because of that, she is in this great lineage that led down to Jesus. Right here in the genealogy, we have two women. Two women that shouldn't be there at all. They don't belong anywhere on this list. Anywhere on this list at all. But here they are because God used these two women. And God will use anyone to fulfill his purpose. And this story of Ruth is such a great reminder uh, for us to have. The story shows us that God is always in control and always working for his plan. Always working even into the smallest and most minute details God is working 
This story took place in Bethlehem. And we talked about how this city uh, belonged to Ephraim, even though it was in the province of Judah. And, you know, that's a cool fact that we can understand, that we can dig up, and it has so much greater significance to it. We know from Ruth and from the Gospels that Jesus' lineage comes directly through Bethlehem. And, and what is fascinating is that Boaz, the father of Obed, the, great, or the grandfather of David, descended from Judah through Perez. Therefore, David, and then obviously, ultimately, Jesus, brings together in this lineage three significant threads. David and Jesus bring down the line of Judah, and also the line of Ephraim, and also now, because of Ruth and Rahab, the line of the Gentiles. How crazy is that? So in this house, we have Judah, Ephraim, and a Gentile. This uniquely gives David and ultimately Jesus the authority to be king over all, all people, over the, the, the kingdom of Judah, over the kingdom of Israel, and over all of the Gentiles. It's a triple lineage that Jesus has every single person born. And we'll learn in a couple weeks that the land of Israel is broken into two, Israel and Judah, and Jesus comes from both of those nations. Jesus comes from both of those nations and also through the line of Gentiles. And this is important because of this. Jesus is the true guardian redeemer of all mankind. All mankind. Jesus is the kinsman redeemer for all mankind because he literally descended from every person. If you're a Jew that's from the tribe of Judah, Jesus descended from your line. If you are a Jew uh, from any other tribe other than Judah, Jesus descended from your line. If you are a Gentile and non-Jew, Jesus is a part of your lineage and he descended from your line. Jesus is our true one redeemer. And what was the main job of the redeemer? It was to buy back, to redeem what was lost. And that is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus came to this earth to spill his blood as a payment to cover the sins of all mankind throughout all time. So that's why when we look at the cross, we can see that he was saying, look, I am buying this back from you. I am buying your sin back and I am giving you to God fully redeemed. Paul put it this way in Titus 2. He says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and, pure, and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. He gave himself for us so that we could be redeemed to him. So that we could be redeemed through his blood. We were lost. We were lost and we were down and out and we were broken. Lost with no hope, no chance of ever getting it back. Yet Jesus came and spilled his blood in order to pay that price so that we could be redeemed. Because of Christ's sacrifice, we have the opportunity to return to God and be with him throughout all of eternity. And all we have to do is follow him. He did all the work in redeeming us. We just have to come to him. So we're going to end this service uh, with a song of invitation and a song of worship. It's a time to come and place our faith in Christ if we haven't already done that. And for, lo for those of us that have done it, to praise God and to worship his name for his amazing grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everything that you have given to us. And for such an awesome story of redemption in the book of Ruth. That even though Naomi and Ruth were down and out. You were working to get them redeemed so that they could be saved. And then we can just look at that and see the, the great parallels between that and what Jesus did for us. That even though we were down and out, even though we were broken, even though we were lost and could no way get back on our own, you were there. You were there the whole time working this great plan so that Jesus could come and spill his blood as a price to redeem us. We love you and we're thankful for your grace and we're thankful for your love. And it's in your sons that we pray. Amen.